He's 16, and he's the youngest member of the Sacramento Republic FC. Oh, it feels amazing. I've, I'm very happy here, and that's why I picked the sign for Sacramento Republic. Though the Roseville native, Roberto Hadigan, isn't playing in this match against San Antonio, he's ready. This is not only a goal, but a dream. No, I can't say anything else, but I'm excited just, uh, just to play with such you know, good players. I see them on the field, how they pass, how they move, and I'm, I'm just happy I'm among them. There have been a great many sacrifices for this high school junior that have made it possible for him getting to this point. I didn't go to any parties when I was like, since signing my contract, I didn't go to any parties. No girls, pretty much no girlfriend, sadly. Uh, you know, just like a lot of sacrifices I had to make, not going out, not staying out too late, not eating the wrong stuff. This young female fan was already in awe. She grabbed a selfie with him. I don't know his name, but he's winning the Sacramento Republic game. Now he's only 16, did you know that? And he's local. <laughs>
I mean, they're two different things. They're two different entities. I mean, you got a restaurant versus tires. So no, I, I wouldn't put the two together. The Firestone Public House restaurant is owned by the Wong family, Curtis, Allen, and Mason, and the DeVeres, Simon, and Henry. They issued this statement, quote, we are aware of the suit and are working through the details to properly respond. Mason Wong. The restaurant opened in 2012. It's unclear what sparked the suit. We reached out to the law firm that filed the lawsuit and got no response. Dozens of crews working through the night, racing to secure the emergency spillway before the rain starts. We have crews out there putting giant boulders into some of the erosion, uh, putting aggregate and then filling that with cement slurry so that it solidifies that and stops the erosion from continuing. Earlier, two helicopters dropped bags of gravel on erosion points. A line of trucks made their way up a road next to the dam, also delivering more rocks. We wanted to make sure before this next system came in that we got as much work done as possible. Officials continue to release water from the reservoir at 100,000 cubic feet per second. Tonight, the lake levels fell an additional five feet and are now 26 feet below the emergency spillway. And currently, we only have about 20,000 cubic feet per second coming in. So we got 80,000 cubic feet per second coming out of the lake, which is great. Some progress, but we're certainly not out of the danger zone yet. A lot of water um, is still up within the watershed. And again, we're monitoring and evaluating that on a continuous basis. High wind may also slow down efforts. The wind gets too much during the day and we can't have a helicopters out there. We'll put them on the ground until they're able to fly again. And while the Department of Water Resources says it's not too concerned about the next couple of storms, many residents remain concerned about their safety. With the rains coming in and the heavy, heavy rains, I think we're still in trouble. But they're not letting enough water out. They're going to accommodate the storms that are coming in. Meanwhile, Butte County Sheriff's reminding everyone we're still in a state of emergency. They have to maintain vigilance. Those first bars of the national anthem have become the most anticipated moment in sports this week. Franklin High School football players chose to lock their arms together in this game. Sheldon High School chose to stand at attention. Coaches on both sides said they had team meetings with students deciding what to do. This does put a little pressure um, on all of us. Uh, this is a this is a big deal. It was a good conversation. We talked about the importance of uh, the anthem and we talked about the importance of uh, the First Amendment and the uh, you know expression of uh, free speech. In the stands, the debate also hitting home for football families. Everybody's got to talk about it. Monica Heenan's daughter is a Sheldon cheerleader. She says she recently discovered her daughter wasn't standing for the pledge at school. Surprised at first, then came her daughter's explanation. Where it says for liberty and justice for all, our kids don't see that. that the, and that's the world that we've created for them, right? They're not seeing liberty and justice for all. Her grandpa is full-blood Native American. It wasn't until 1968 they only got 40% of the Bill of Rights. Carol Sutherland's son plays football for Sheldon High and says no one should protest the anthem. My son actually brought it up to me. He said, I don't understand, Mom. Why can't they just stand? Amidst this all-American scene, a lesson in American civics. It's high school football, right? They don't call it football high school. And what the Star Spangled Banner is all about. The home of the free. The shelf clouds over Auburn has locals thinking of snow. In Auburn, we get the cold weather all the time. We get all the down breezes and it freezes and all that, but we never get any of the light stuff to play in. So I think it'd be fun. And the fun may be on the way. The National Weather Service predicts low-lying areas like Auburn may see snow early Monday morning. And that has some parents like Jacqueline Evans already planning for the possibility of snow. Probably make hot chocolate and go outside and feel it open our mouths. <laughs> Further up I-80 into Blue Canyon and the snow hasn't been as fun. Traffic is heavier than I have ever seen it, uh, winter or summer. Dave Woods with Caltrans says their crews have been out since 11 a.m. trying to maintain roads. But heavy snow late Sunday afternoon slowed them down, creating massive traffic backups for those headed home after a long holiday weekend. Oh, bumper to bumper, not fun. <laughs> I don't recommend it to anybody. Despite the inconvenience, Wood is thankful the traffic has at least been manageable. Fortunately, everybody's going slow. They're, uh, they're being patient, but now we have chain control in both directions, just trying to safely get everybody off this hill tonight.
The cowbells synonymous with alpine skiing are ringing once again in Squaw Valley. Oh, World Cup, you know, 50 years. I've been waiting for this for a long time. Richard Schuler is one of thousands of race fans from around the world here in Squaw Valley for the Women's World Cup. Hey, this is a genuine cow outfit from Switzerland. It was a real cowbell, huh? Once again, Red Dog Ridge, the site of the 1960 Winter Olympics and the 69 World Cup, is on the international stage. This time for the Women's World Cup. Among the American athletes is Leila Lapena from nearby Incline Village. She signed autographs after her race. Everyone's really supportive. I have a lot of friends and family and fans from my home mountain in Diamond Peak. And yeah, it feels great. Thank you, good to be home. Yeah, really good to be home. The Gilieri family are big racing fans. They didn't want to miss a chance to watch world-class athletes compete on home turf. It's awesome. It's amazing to actually come out here and see it live and in person and then also have someone from the USA win. That win went to Olympic gold medalist Michaela Schifrin, who currently is in first place on the World Cup circuit. As for those on the World Cup circuit, California may be better known for the surf and sun, but organizers are hoping this weekend reignite Squaw Valley's Olympic legacy and to showcase the region as a possible host for future international sporting events. It's is incredible. These are, these are the racers that we'll see in less than a year in the, in the Olympic Winter Games. So uh, this is a really cool moment for this region. Basketball fans are cheering for their teams, but there are millions of reasons for fans to cheer for Sacramento. It's a $5 million economic impact conservatively. You know, you have fans from all over the country that are going to come in to watch their teams play. After a 10-year absence, Sacramento will host the NCAA Division I Men's Basketball Championship first and second rounds. Finally about time. <laughs> well, this beautiful Golden One Center and all the hard work they're doing in the city, this is... This city is turning around. It's, it's really exciting times to be here. Next week, there will be eight teams fighting their way to the Final Four, and that means thousands of fans fighting for rooms and other accommodations. We have a big convention coming in town uh, at the same time during the tournament. That convention will consume about 4,000 hotel rooms. You add the 3,500 hotel rooms that the teams will consume. That doesn't count any of the fans. Uh, Sacramento is going to be at capacity next week. And surrounding communities get a win as well. Elk Grove, Davis, Rockland, uh, they're, they're all going to see big business from this tournament. And local businesses will score. You know, we're really, we're anticipating anything. I mean, we're anticipating for a very, 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 very busy day and probably our busiest uh, weekend ever. The arena may be the gift that just keeps on giving. To have the new arena, this was part of why it was built, for big events like this. If Sacramento does well, it's a slam dunk for future events. So we want to make this just an amazingly easy event for the NCAA. We want to fill the building with every single session to show them that we don't want this one time. We wanted to get it every single year. Uh, barbershop is a place where you can come to feel comfortable. You know, you can talk, you know, politics, sports, anything. But the conversation was cut short after vandals marred the walls of the Supreme Barber Lounge with swastikas and racial slurs two weeks ago. All the clippers were stolen, the chairs and mirrors damaged. This barber shop had always been owner Nick Fink's dream. This was its first year in operation. This is devastation, um, hurt mainly hurt. The act crossed a line with this Tahoe Park neighborhood and brought out the best in its neighbors. You know, luckily we, we have a strong community. Um, I have really good people uh, working with me. A new emblem is being painted on the very spot where a swastika was placed. It is a sign of this community's resilience. I knew it was devastating, you know, not just for Nick, but, but for, you know, people in the community. So um, I'm just glad here to be here to support and um, be back in the, in the chair. The same goes for Momo's meat market next door. It was also hit by racist graffiti and a window was smashed. And I was just like appalled about it. You didn't understand why somebody would do such a thing. Here, the food and the flavor of the community continue to blend. Reunited as you can see signs and everything. As the sun set over Point Pleasant, the focus is on the water. We lose farm ground, we lose crops, we lose money. For Cody Bayless and his family, it's already been a tough winter. This new round of flooding just adds to their fears of financial hardship. The water stays on crops. Um, it kills a lot of the crops that are planted. Farming is not that good right now, so it's all of us are hurting. It. Flood water started saturating the soil early Saturday, already threatening crops and livestock. 
the residents may want to stay on and salvage their fields and farm animals, the county has been warning residents to evacuate. It's coming. Th that's the bottom line. The water's coming. Matt Robinson is with the Department of Water Resources. They predict this second round of winter flooding from the Kasumnas and McCallamy Rivers to be worse. This time, there's more water and it's coming down with more force. We did have enough water going down that we thought the levees would be able to hold. The problem is, is that the first round beat up the levees pretty bad. Worried the levees wouldn't be able to handle the pressure. A levee was broke earlier this morning, much higher up the river stream. Bayless is optimistic that will help ease water gushing towards his family's farm. But he knows Mother Nature makes no promises. Nothing you can do with Mother Nature. All you can do is sit back and really watch, um, see what happens. The now infamous Orville Spillway, with its gushing water and crumbling concrete, could create a business boom in this small city if Orville Mayor Linda Dahlmeyer has her way. We're the water source for almost the entire state of California. And um, once people realize that, it's a nice place to visit. Dahlmeyer says she's done international interviews on the Orville evacuation. Now she wants the world to know the name Orville for all it has to offer. We have a ladybug migration. We have the second largest um, salmon migration. The massive water releases into the Feather River are also prompting hope. Orville, meaning city of gold, will have another gold rush. So all these little yellow dots represent million dollar gold strikes. Joey Wilson owns Adventures in Prospecting Mining Supplies. What people are getting excited about that know anything about gold, that means that the gold is actually moving, then more gold's being exposed. So people are already starting to come in and ask questions and buy equipment. Wilson says the pressure from all this water is loosening gold nuggets set in the river bottom. He's banking on a bump in business. It means more customers and, of course, more sales and the ability to expand. The spillway crisis now seemingly passed. How quickly can Orville grab this global spotlight? for something good. You know, we have a chest of gold coins still to be discovered, so. Crews hoisted the wreckage of the small plane backwards from its final crash landing spot in a backyard. The airplane's tail battered, its wings sawed off, its propellers bent. The FAA reports the plane was bound for San Carlos from Auburn when investigators believe the pilot attempted an emergency landing at McClellan Airfield. The air traffic recordings describe the initial crash aftermath. We got a downed aircraft out here. They're, they're a mile short from the, uh, the runway right on the approach. The pilot, oral surgeon Marshall McCallion, is shown here with his Lance Air plane that he was flying when he crashed. McCallion was a volunteer for Angel Flight and had flown 28 missions, flying children with burn scars and hearing impairments to special needs camps in his plane. It's sad. It's very sad. Kenton Kaiser is a pilot at the Auburn Airport where McCallion took off from before the crash. He says McCallion's Lancer, a high-performance plane, was the envy of the airport. He had quite a bit of experience with the hours he had, and, uh, and he had built the airplane that he was flying. NTSB crews removed the plane from the crash site and will deconstruct it at a wreckage warehouse. I'll do a teardown examination where I'll thoroughly look at the engine. A terrifying plane crash that's left a respected pilot and dedicated volunteer dead. Now the search for what went wrong. It's a great day to be in and around the water. Wonderful, beautiful, sun's out, the water's nice and cool, everybody's having a great time. Discovery Park opened on Friday after months of being closed due to flooding. The landscape of the park and the waterways changed. That's why DART, or Drowning Accident Rescue, is here to help. We've already assisted two people today with two boats. One jet ski went down and one boat went down. But the real mission here is education and prevention. The water is different. The hydrology is different. Everything is different about this beach. That's why they had it shut down for so long. Um, so the education is much needed. DART members patrol the beaches, checking for life jackets on children and helping parents with safety information because life looks good on everyone.